Hey, good morning guys, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to another edition of Suggest Live Houdini Special. Um, I never know what to say when I <laughs> introduce that. Uh, my name is Daniel Hurrigan, I'm the Head of Effects at CG Spectrum. And uh, I'm going to keep going today with something that I started working on last week. Um, and just see, see where I get with it. So if you recall I was working on a kit bash asset and just trying to destroy it using some animation so it's always good to have some animation as a starting point um just because it you know it gives you motion an interesting motion as well uh it makes it makes creating these things a little bit a little bit easier and a little bit more interesting so um I'm just going to keep going with it and see you know see where I can get to with it I hope everybody has had a good week. I've had a good week. It's been nice and sunny here on the weekend. Um, so if you recall, this is what I got up to at the end of last week's stream, which is this bison buffalo, um, I guess it's buffalo, um, running through this market stall. And this is an asset from Kitbash that I purchased and yeah, I just, you know, could thought it would be a fun thing to try and try and destroy it. And there's lots more to this asset than what I've got here. Hey Tyson, morning's going good, thank you. It was nice and sunny this morning. Enjoyed my coffee. In the sun, which is great. It's starting to warm up here. Has been freezing lately. How are you going, Tyson? Um So yeah, there's loads more to this asset that we can do, and there's, you know, further refinements that we can do on this simulation that we have you can see hey david how's it going nice to see you live and in person um so yeah you can see you know the jump that i put in that sort of frame 25 um velocity impulse that i put in there it's kind of good for knocking things about but it also looks a bit weird in some part some parts so maybe controlling that a little bit uh, i won't go into those refinements just yet i'll push on with adding more to this simulation and then we'll go back and, and refine um, the vellum as well you know you can see there's lots of normal issues it's pretty low res so maybe going back and revisiting that as well might be a good thing to do at some point uh, so let's have a look if you recall we did a lot of prep hey nice sun is always good Good to make you feel feel better about the world. Sit in the sun. Um, so I'm gonna just do out misc wood. Um, so yeah, we did all this prep, or I did. You guys, you guys helped. Um, so I've got all these different components that I can use, and I, so far I've just done the crates over here. You can see I could I could bring in the misc wood, I could bring in barrels. I think the barrels would be a good one to bring in. And also, you know, it might be interesting to do the frame. Uh, we also have this metal here. So we could bring that in to our simulation. And you can actually see that these some of these parts really should be constrained to the crates that we've simulated. But I'll show you an interesting thing that we could do with those. I think probably what I want to do... So I, I think I'll do the... I'll add the barrels into my crate simulation. But what I want to do is kind of isolate some of these things. So there are there are elements here that I don't want in that simulation. So we've got this stuff, which is part of the crates. But this, you know, I don't want that jug in there. I don't really want these wind chimes in there at this stage. Probably want to do that as a separate simulation. So... What I might do, rather than doing material splitting on here, I can clearly see these things in the air that I don't want. So I'm just going to select those manually. Uh, these look like parts of crates, perhaps. Amar, how are you? Thank you for the thank you for the help in producing your name because I can't read that. Um, thanks for joining me, Amar. Uh, Alright, so that looks like maybe everything. I mean, it doesn't matter. We can always come back in and, and change. 
let's go back here and just go back to the start and just see what all those bits are. Ah, I see. So there's nails on this table here and there's nails everywhere. I wonder if they have a specific name because maybe we can isolate those nails. Because I'll show you something cool that you can do with these. Let's see. So only show selected in the geometry spreadsheet. Primitives. Let's look at the material. Iron. Okay, so let's... I said I wasn't going to do a shop material part split, but let's do it either based on a group or based on a material. Let's have a look and see if we have any groups. Ah, oh, there is an iron group. All right, so let's, let's blast that away and see what we're left with. Hopefully it leaves... Oops. Hopefully it leaves the bits of um, the bits of barrel, but maybe it doesn't. Looks like it removes everything. Well, that sucks. All right, let's see. Let's see what the barrel, whether the barrel has anything useful on it. So that's got the iron material as well. It's also though in. Maybe it's in a barrel group? Let's see. Hey, Audrey! I'm good, thank you. How are you? Let's see if it's in the barrel group. It's always, you know, this is all part of just trying to figure this stuff out. There we go. So, we do actually have some in barrels. Although, you know, this is the annoying thing about it is that not all of them are in there. So, I might just have to now go in and do a manual selection. So, I'll clear that group out of there. And then I'll manually select these other barrel parts. And then we should have, I'm going to merge those back together. We should have two. There we go. So we've got all the barrel parts now. Let's have a look at the metal, the rest of the metal. And here as well, I can sort of take that blast and delete non-selected. And then I get all those elements. And over here as well, I should be able to delete non-selected and then get, you know, those, and then maybe I'll just do a selection on these guys again. And then I've just got all the nails. So that's handy. Uh, so, yeah, okay, so more nails. I am doing well, thank you. Audrey, how are you doing? Um, out, let's go out nails here. Out barrel, uh, I don't know what these are called. They have a specific name. If anyone remembers, let me know. Out barrel something rings. Nah, they have. I think they have like a more specific name than that. Out metal misc. Getting cold in Canada. Yeah, it's getting warm here and getting cold. It's the opposite. Although it gets really cold in Canada. I don't think it gets that cold here. It never really snows where I am. Hey, Ibram. Nice to meet you too. How are you? Thanks for joining me. Um, all right. So just finishing off doing some prep with this. So we've got the barrel. It isn't human. No, it isn't. Awful. Um, I'm just going to call these barrel rings, seeing as nobody, nobody's jumping in with a, nobody's jumping in with an answer. I'm sure they have a different name, but that's okay. Um, so we've got out barrels. So I'm going to. Oh, let's have a look. Mis misc wood. So there's a barrel in this misc wood. Curses. Let's check the barrel rings. So that one over there doesn't have... That one over there doesn't have any rings on it, I don't think. Let's see. Oh, it does! Where are those? Ah, oh, you know what? They're ropes, I think. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Lots of stuff going on with this asset. Alright, so we need to, from this misc wood, grab this barrel here. Let's just do a manual selection on that. And I guess I'll grab this one too. That one kind of looks like it's got some fractures going on, but maybe it's just, um, maybe it's just the polygons, the way they've been warped or something. You can see there's some weird stuff going on here too. So I'll blast those out and merge those with 
my barrels so that everything is together. Ah, hoops! Yeah, there we go. I knew that was a, I knew that was a name. Barrel hoops. That sounds right. Thanks, Brendan. Nice one. Um, all right, so there we go. Got all our barrels. We've got our barrel rings. Now let's bring that over to our RBD. And we've already got barrels here. So let's merge our barrel rings as well. Our barrel underscore rings should uh, maybe barrel rings. There we go. So there we go. We've got, got our barrels and we've got our barrel rings. And we know after we tested last time, if we just plug in a um, plug into this, that we get that kind of thing. And on frame 25, we get a little, little jump from our pop solver that's inside here or our pop wrangle. Frame 25, grab some velocity. So let's jump back, turn that off. And yeah, they just fall apart, which is cool. Uh, we also need to do our 10 times transformation. Is Blender better or Maya? Uh, I don't know. I use neither of them. I would say Houdini as the answer to that question. Um, yeah, I don't know. It depends what you're doing, I suppose. If, uh, if you're looking, you know, if you're looking at modeling or animation, um, I mean, Blender is good for lots of things. The issue with Blender is that it is not widely used in the industry at this time. So for me, you know, there is no point to me learning Blender because I won't be able to get a job knowing Blender, but yeah. You know, if you choose Maya or you choose Houdini, something like that, something widely accepted and widely used in the industry, then, you know, you're kind of going down a path that is going to get you a job. Um, I've seen lots of really cool things coming out of Blender, but, uh, you know, I see lots of cool things coming out of Houdini too. Um, so, let's see. I think that looks pretty cool. I mean, potentially we don't really need to shatter these barrels. What will be interesting is when we get the barrel rings or the hoops, as Brendan kindly pointed out, the hoops in there is that they're going to kind of hold it together. So we need to kind of think about, you know, what sort of behavior we want from this. So I'm going to transform the hoops as well. And it looks like probably this one over here is not part of the mix. So I'm just going to remove that for now. I think that actually belongs to the lid over here. There we go. So these hoops, if I was to run those into a bullet solver like that, their collision shape by default is convex hull. So when you run a convex hull over something like that, it's going to basically create a collision all the way through. So if, so if I was to throw a ball in here, it would bounce off this invisible plane. It sort of caps the, the tube. So, and it's a little bit hard to tell. Um, what do we have? Visualize. Geometry representation. Let's see if that works. I find that this is, yeah, incredibly slow. But there we go. You can see that it kind of shrink wraps across those shapes. Now you can change that to be concave and then that will perfectly represent that shape, but it's pretty inefficient to do it. Saying that I, you know, quite often will use concave and it looks like it hasn't changed. Uh, or maybe here, no, it looks like it's probably maybe only changing that for the collisions and not actually the bullet, um, the bullet object itself. It doesn't look like we actually have any option unless it's under advanced. Um, doesn't look like we have an option with this simplified version to change it to concave for the RBD object only for the only for the collision, which is interesting. So, you know, perhaps we need to 
break this or, or just set it up ourselves. And, and, you know, to be honest, usually I will just set this up from scratch, but I like using these just for, for speed. But perhaps we do need to go in and actually do this properly now that we want a little bit more kind of control. So I'm going to put a null here for starters and say out oops. And I'm going to put an assemble down as well, naming these oops, and also packing them. So that's important for bullet. You can see we have 40 packed fragments. If I go into my dotnet now and put down a bullet, uh, actually I'll use a rigid body solver, which is set to bullet. It has extra inputs, which are useful for doing, you know, custom stuff. Um, whereas if you just put down a bullet solver, it doesn't have those. It's a bit more annoying to plug in sop solvers and, and wrangles and stuff. You have to use a multi solver. So this one, this one is actually more user friendly. And then if I put down an RBD packed object, I can grab first context or I can put the path in out hoops. There they are. Hey, Rizwan, how's it going? Um, so if now we have a look at the show guard geometry, there you go. You can see it's really quick to display. That's great. And if I change convex to concave, we can see that that shrink wrapping goes away and you get that, which is perfect um, representation. But as I said, it is slow. Not to say that I don't do that sometimes if I'm feeling lazy or I'm just doing a really quick theme. Um, you know, it's kind of fine. So we can try it, but we can also have a look at ways to do it without doing that. So over here, I'm going to put an assemble as well. And this one, I'm going to change the output prefix to barrels. Leave it packed, so we've got 152 pack fragments there. And then same thing, out, barrels. Here we go, out barrels. There we go. So we've got our, we'll put our hoops to concave. Well, I'll call this RVD hoops, just so I know which one is which. There we go. Uh, we'll leave our barrels as convex because that should be, that should be fine for the barrels. You can see that that matches pretty well. They're pretty convex um, shapes anyway. Although you probably will see inside of here, you can see how there's the curvature of that inside of the barrel and there's the collision shape. Whereas if I set that at the concave, it's going to match it perfectly. So, you know, it kind of depends. Let's set it to convex and see what happens. When I turn these on, I don't know what will happen. I suspect that perhaps we'll get some um, explosion going on. Back in Alabama, you were in California, is that right, Rizwan? Ground plane merge. Okay, so I've got a gravity in there, I've got a ground plane. I have some artifacts. Where do I have artifacts? On my wall? On my render? On my face? Um, I love a good artifact. So let's see. Yeah, it's pretty slow, but let's uh, let's turn off the guide geometry because that is always slow to display. Um, well, it looks like we've got the hoop geometry on as well. There we go. On your render. Ah, it's just the um, it was just the intersection of the collision geometry and the display geometry, looking, you know, looking weird. That was all that that was. Um, all right, so, well, you can see that the hoops actually have held the barrels together, except for this one, which is missing that rope. Maybe we remove that one so that we're only focusing on these ones that have the hoops. But as you can see, they're kind of now staying together, which is, which is pretty interesting. Now, we've got to bring our old uh, buffalo in as well. So let's grab... The buffalo. Make sure he's the right scale. I can't remember. Yeah, he looks like the right scale. And let's create an out here. So null, we'll take it off the peak. 
So remember we inflated it a little bit. Now, yeah, we can do that in our custom one. We can do that a little bit easier. So let's call that out buffalo collision and go back into our top net. There's a couple of ways of dealing with collisions in bullet. You can bring them in as RBD packed objects, which often I will do, or you can bring it in as a static object. Um, and really, you know, there's very little difference when it comes to bullet with this stuff. So I'm just gonna find that, our buffalo collision. Use deforming because it's updating every frame. Collisions. Don't be fooled and go to this one because this doesn't have any bearing. It still displays your collision guide, but it actually doesn't have any bearing on the bullet collisions. You must go to bullet data, show guide geometry, and you can see that is actually our collision for bullet. So it's a convex hull. Concave will give us perfect representation of that. You can also use like a sphere, then he'll just be like a big sphere moving through. Um, let's just try the convex, it's probably fine, you know, it probably doesn't matter. But you also have down here, so I was talking about, where you can add more padding to make that larger if you wanted to. So, you know, you can always do that. But yeah, always turn off the guide, because it is slow to display. Well, let's see what happens. So, stay puffed marshmallow buffalo. And Kablamo. See you later, barrels. Okay, let's see what happens. Look, it's pretty good. You know, it's not bad. It's probably what would happen. There would potentially be some denting that might happen to these hoops, but um Hey Mateo, yeah, this is my new my new digs, my new office and my new my new house that I moved to recently. Um, inside a, a room inside a shed in my backyard which is freezing it's fully insulated and it's nice and warm outside but it's quite cold in here so I've turned the heater on um, all right so yeah you know I think that's pretty cool there's there's some like complexity to that simulation but it might be nice to see some deformation or even some breaking from the hoops. Because I think the way that the hoops are constructed, I don't believe that they're welded. I think they are kind of, um, you know, sort of overlapped. Or you can see it there, kind of like a belt where they wrap around. And then, you know, potentially if that was to break that bolt, then the hoop would sort of open. So... It might be interesting to play around with deformation with that. And the way that we could do that with RBDs, because, you know, it, uh, deformation is not really a thing with RBDs. You can't get, you know, things floppy like a cloth simulation in vellum, but there are ways to kind of fake it. So what we could do is actually fracture the hoops up. Now I'm going to take this assembly, I'm going to turn off pack, but I'll leave the output prefix of hoops on. And then use a Voronoi fracture, just a very simple break, to do a very small amount of fracturing. So I don't want to you know, break these up into millions of pieces, but I do want to just break them up a little bit. There we go. I mean, that's that's not too bad. Getting a couple of tiny pieces, which arguably aren't great, um, but you know, it's it's okay. Probably might be good to split the bolts out before we do this fracture just so they don't accidentally get split in half but um i don't know it's probably okay now this will stamp over the name attribute here so we do have to be a little bit careful with that perhaps i won't do the assemble there perhaps i'll take that assemble out and use it after the Vorono fracture or actually I could probably on the Vorono fracture just do piece prefix hoops here. And then I don't need this assemble until later and I can turn off create name attribute. So all I'm doing with this then is packing. The reason that I'm being uh, fussy with that is because I'm about to create some constraints and the name attribute is really important to preserve once you've created it. So you can see there's our hoops name. We've got a constraint which we could take off of here, 
and that's a glue constraint which is going to hold them together but it's not what i want for creating this sort of fake soft body simulation so what i'm going to do off of here is do a connect adjacent pieces and you can see that one the adjacent pieces from points it's going to create little little points basically it's creating little primitives but it will create little connections between adjacent pieces that have different names so it, it has a you know a radius so searching within a proximity and you can see there like it's creating a little connection between that bolt and that piece but it won't create a connection within the piece itself it will just create connections from the surface points of two nearby pieces and you can change the radius so it's really small you can see some of those larger ones go away we are also going to want to turn on rest length because we're going to use this as a soft constraint so we need a length to know how big it was to begin with there we go so you can you know they're so small you can't really see them in the viewport but if you turn on point display you can see that there's a whole bunch of things there holding that together now what I'm going to do is put down a... I'm just going to do this in a wrangle. You can use, as we have done over here last week, we use the RBD constraint properties. You can see here, I'm doing the same thing, soft position and rotation. Uh, in fact, I'll just do that. It's, it's just easier. So I'll use that. Uh, actually, that, like that, like that. I don't know if I actually need that one plugged in there. I don't think that's particularly important because all I'm going to do from here is output this as a constraint network. So out uh, hoop con. And then my assemble here is going to go into this null. So I'm packing at this point. So now we've got 243 pack fragments as opposed to whatever we had earlier. Not, not quite as many. So let's try setting that up in this .NET that we have created. It's getting a little bit more complex. But this is the way that I really set things up more often than not. Um, so that I have total control over constraints, geometry, creation, fracturing, all that kind of stuff. Usually it's set up this way. Uh, okay, so we're going to put a soft bullet soft constraint relationship down hook it up to the constraint network and here we're going to bring in that hoopcon there you go you can see those points appeared this needs to match soft needs to match this name here constraint name soft so they need to match here we can set stiffness damping all that kind of stuff um, we can also set the degrees of freedom on our soft constraint so that it can either move only in rotation and not position, or it can move both position and rotation. We may want to experiment with that and maybe just set it to rotation only so that it can only rotate but not really stretch apart. That might be interesting to play with. You can also see that you have the same or similar controls here with, to do with uh, stiffness and um, damping and stuff like that. Let's see what happens. We may see these start to kind of look like they're breaking a little bit. You can see them falling apart, but the proof is going to be when this guy hits and we maybe see them deforming a little bit. You can see those constraints there. Constraints are another good thing to turn off um, when you're simulating because uh, in terms of the guide because they can be slow. But, well, look at this. This this one here, you know, you can see that it's really misshapen now. It's not staying as a perfect thing. This one too. You can see it's starting to spread apart there. And this one, look at that. So that's cool. I like that. That's what we want. And there we go. Look, there's a piece that's sort of broken off. It's a little bit constrained together. And, and this one as well. Like it's kind of being allowed to open up and deform a little more. And that's creating some really interesting behavior. So it's worth, 
you know, it's worth going to the trouble of doing things like this because it it all adds to the complexity of that rigid body behavior. It's not just, you know, it's not just things falling apart. There's now some, some denting and deformation going on, which is, is really nice. You know, in order to achieve realism with a lot of this stuff, it's about the complexity. And as I say in every, you know, thing that I do here, it's about layers. So this is one layer and, you know, there will be many other layers to make this look cool. But yeah, you know, I think it's really nice now to see things like this, where this is allowed to bend off its original axes and sort of deforming. And that is kind of cool as well, you know. You might expect something like that to happen where it gets sort of completely busted and still hangs together a little bit, but... Alright, cool. So that's working pretty well. We can play around with things like stiffness to make them a stronger constraint, and we can also play around with things like maybe we only allow them to rotate so that they can... I think, uh, I think that will mean that they stay connected together better but they're allowed to rotate more or allowed, allowed to rotate. Um, yeah, that's right, Rizwan. It's, it's, you know, it's a similar concept where, ooh, although, look at that, that uh, maybe, maybe we do one position because that, that seems, you know, like it's not really working. So it looks like we do need position as well. Or we could try position instead of rotation. Position only, let's see what that does. Um, that's right. Photoshop, compositing in general, you know, all this sort of stuff is about, is about creating layers and usually, but not always, the more kind of layers and details you add, the better it will look. You can add too much. Certainly in creating an image, you can, you know, you can create too much and add too many layers and, and then you can ruin, you know, something. Sometimes simplicity is good. Um, oh, there we go. Look at that. We're getting now much more sort of spread and deformation, I guess, because they're just constrained in position. The rotation is free. I guess that's what it means. So the rotation is no longer constrained, so they can kind of just flop about. Um, and that's pretty interesting. And it gives me an idea for the rope on the other one, that maybe we could do that with the rope. So, you know, you don't, when you have when you're confronted with rope, you don't always have to simulate necessarily with a wire solver or a vellum solver to create that. You could think about doing it in this way where you create these RBD chains, constrain them together with a soft constraint, and then they sort of behave in a, in a cloth-like or a soft way. I think that's kind of cool, you know? Makes them feel a bit more, a bit more fluid, a bit less rigid. And a bit more springy, like they're, you know, really kind of breaking and springing off, which is cool. I like that. I think that's, I think that's cool. Now we have, you know, we have another problem here where it's all collapsing before, before the action happens. So what I think we'll do is create another constraint, which is going to glue all this stuff together. So we'll take, take our barrels and our hoops. And our barrels, I'm going to turn off create pack geometry for a second. And then I'm going to merge with my hoop geometry, the named hoop geometry. So I'm doing this on the unpacked geo. Again, connect adjacent pieces. Set it to pieces from surface points this time. And that will give me, you can recognize that as a glue constraint if you're familiar with this stuff. Basically, from the centroid of each piece, it will create a connection. And that should hold everything together until the moment of impact. Now here, instead of doing the RBD constraint properties, I'm just going to do a wrangle. I'm going to set it to primitives. And the two important uh, attributes that you need are airsat constraint type. And this is uh, pause, rotation, you know, position and rotation together. That's where you can define this. And I usually just write all, so it constrains all uh, of those. So s at constraint underscore name, and this is where I would write glue. So they're the two important things that you need. 
Uh, they're both string string attributes. It has to run on primitives. Make sure you get spelling right. And then I'm just going to create a another null out uh, barrel glue. Create a second constraint network. Well, that is a lot of layers. Rizwan, 335. Wow. That sounds, that sounds like a lot. It sounds hard to manage. I, I know when I have a comp uh, that has, you know, tons and tons of layers, it can, it can become annoying to work with something that has so many layers. But uh, what is it? What's 335 layers that you're working with? It sounds, it sounds exciting. All right, glue. There we go. You can see it there, red. It's a little bit hard to see with these on, but there's our red connection. So in theory, if I hit play now, things will hold together. Not really. That's interesting. Let's see why that might be. Barrel glue, glue con. Ah, you know what? I didn't pack my barrels here. And my hoops are packed, so I need to put down. I just do it with another assemble. I just turn off create name, create packed. Let's see if that works. Well, it's working better, but still not quite. So, you know, what we might need to do, you can see actually when I step through that that glue disappears. So, have a look at this. You can see how that glue is breaking before we even get going. So, what that tells me is my strength value maybe needs to come up. Now if I hit play, oh there we go, you can see it's kind of hanging together, there's a bit of motion in this barrel here. And then as soon as the buffalo hits it, then it's allowed to, uh, it's allowed to open. Uh, Rizwan, no I'm not, I, I don't know your, I don't know your link, how can I find it? So, yeah, so we can see that constraint now holding together. There's a bit of motion in this barrel, which I might want to kind of reduce. And it just occurred to me that I'm simulating this from frame one. We're really, I don't need to. I can simulate this from frame 39, let's say. You don't need to simulate from the very start all the time. Just choose a frame sort of right before the action starts. And then you've got less time for things to go wrong, you know? Uh, I don't know if you can enter it in the chat, Rizwan. You might be able to, you can give it a shot. So yeah, you know, starting at just one frame before means that nothing's gonna really have time to fall apart or fall down before the, the buffalo gets there. I see a lot of people always starting their team at frame one and then, you know, maybe the action doesn't ha happen until frame 200 or something. You're just wasting simulation time. And it also means that you kind of have to hold things together and try and work other things out. Whereas, you know, often you don't don't really need to do that. All right, so I think this is pretty cool. I, I, like, I like what's happening here. We've got some barrels holding together and that's fine as well. Especially if, you know, over time, over the length of the... Um, yeah, that, that's it, David. Glass, glass is an interesting one. And you know, I had some students going through the CD Spectrum course recently, and one of the exercises was to do a bullet projectile hitting glass and causing it to break. Um, which I think is a good exercise, but what I usually tell people is that in reality, we don't, we don't do that. You know, bullets are incredibly fast moving things and you never you don't actually see a bullet right you only really see what happens when the bullet hits something or you know if it's a tracer you might see the little glowing tail but what we do because it's too hard and you need too many sub steps to get that collision to work is we will just create a moment of impact so we'll put we'll shatter our window and then just the same as what I did on this um, 
what I did on this simulation where I had a pop wrangle that imparted some velocity that I had predefined. Uh, can't see your link, sorry, Rizwan. Um, maybe you can just tell me what to look up. Um, so I create a velocity that's predefined and we just get it to burst at a particular frame or at a particular moment. And you could drive that by some, you know, some object, but it's much easier to do that rather than to have a really fast moving projectile. Um, and you know, when you play it, you, you can put the projectile in there later after the simulation, but then you, you don't have to worry about, you know, getting that working. You don't have to have like 24 sub steps to make that work. For example, um, you just have one sub step and a blast at a particular frame. It's really easy to control then as well. Um, okay. I will, I will look it up this one after, uh, after the stream. I don't have, I don't have the internet open while I am um, live stream. Um, so yeah, I, I would look at that David because it, it is way easier to control and you can still define those points by some intersection that maybe you define in SOPS. So, you know, I've seen all sorts of tools that people have created over the years, um, different methods for, you know, for defining them. Some, some people will like draw, you know, if it's like a strafing bullet hit, for example, some people will draw a line on the window. Um, and you know, based on the sampling of points on that line, you could, you could cause little blasts to happen. Maybe it's something I can show you in, in future streams. Um, someone breaking the window projectile to initiate the break. Right. Yeah. Look, I, I think that the, you know, the way that I mentioned is a, is a really good way. It gives you, gives you a lot of control. Um, yeah, I see. So like, yeah, bullet hits or something hits and then you, and then you break it. Um, yeah, look, you know, try it out. Oh, there's all sorts of different ways to do things, but I find that using collision to drive, um, a break when it's a really fast moving thing, like a bullet, um, it's just, yeah, it's so much harder. Uh, okay. So where was I? Hey, Adam, how you going? Um, all right, let's see where... Where were we? So I think, hey, no worries. Yeah, let me know how you go. Um, I think this is looking pretty cool. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of life there. I'm, I'm not fracturing the, um, the barrel, you know, bits of wood. I could do, but I don't know that it needs it. I think it's kind of, you know, I think it's kind of okay. Um, yeah, cool, thanks. You'll have to go back and see what I did for the, um, for the hoops barrel hoops. I think they're looking kind of cool. Um, all right. So I think that's looking great. Let's, let's dop import this out properly because I've got a dot net now. I need to merge it out correctly. So I'll grab my dot net up there, fetch geometry from dot net. And in object mask, you will notice that I called both of my RVD objects, RVD underscore something. The reason that I've kept those names consistent is so that in object mask, I can just say RVD star and it will grab just the things that I need rather than also bringing out my collision geometry and my ground plane. I don't want that stuff coming out. So I always use naming to be able to isolate the things that I need. So that's looking cool. Now we've got nothing before frame 39. So often I will also put a time shift down only 45 minutes late. Getting better every every week. Um, so what I'm going to do here is clamp to first and set that to 39. And you can also do things like this where you take the start frame, copy parameter, paste relative reference. So that if I was to change the start frame of my dot net, my time shift clamp would also change. And you can see now it's holding on that first frame before the buffalo hits. So we got that. Now, what else are we, what else are we dealing with here? Let's have a look at our little, little world here. So we've got our transforms at the end here, transforming back to the original scale. So let me plug that in, have a look. Weird colors going on here. We can see that little jump there. Definitely need to fix that. Um, there we go. So you can see those two things tying together. Now they're not, 
they're not uh, in the same simulation world, so they, there will be some very subtle in, um, intersection going on because they're not really behaving together. But does it matter? I don't think you can really tell. You can you can tell there, but maybe yeah. I don't know. I mean, you could. What you could do is simulate them together, of course, or you could use the result of the crates, seeing as they happen first. You could use that as a um, as a collider for the other simulation. Um, could you use a switch for this as well. Uh, yeah. Brendan, I, I assume you're meaning about the time shift clamp. Yes, you could. You could use a switch for that also, so that you know, you're switching between some geometry um, that is static and, and then switching to your simulation. Certainly. Um, okay, so what have we got? We've got that. We've got that. So, yeah, that piece there is probably the problematic one. And it really wouldn't be too hard to get that going. I think what you would do is just... Take the result of this, assemble it, pack it. It doesn't, the, um, the names don't really matter if they can be renamed because we're just going to use it as a collision. So I'm just going to plug it into the .NET up here just to make it easy. And we'll bring it in as a packed object instead of a static object. As I said, you can kind of do either for collisions with bullet. Um, RBD, let's call this boxes, or crates, collision. And you know what? I'm going to not call it RBD because I'm using that star to grab these things here. So I'm just going to call it crates collision. And then it won't come out because we don't need that one coming out. It's going to be first context geometry. There it is. Nice. And it's going to be a deforming static because it's a deforming object in SOPs, so it's deforming. Show guide geometry we could use to display convex holes seems fine. All right, looks like mm, looks like it might be okay. Let's see. And arguably, we don't need all of this stuff, so we could filter out some of those things beforehand. But yeah, it's not that slow, so it's it's okay. You know, it's not crucially important to do this step, but it does mean that we're not going to get any of those intersections, um, which, you know, it's always good to avoid. So it's always a good way to do it when you're creating these layers, layered simulations like this, where you're using, you know, you're doing multiple RBD sims. It's more efficient to do that. It means, you know, if I want to change one, I don't have to go back and change everything. It means you can use one as a collider for the other. This barrel has remained unscathed at this, at this moment in time. Now, also, when we're talking about using one simulation as a collision for another, we have to think about, you know, this is all inside of a cloth uh, tent, you know, so this stuff really, like this barrel that's being booted out of the stratosphere here, I think maybe my gravity needs to be upped, perhaps um, this guy, this will be tearing through the cloth before before the buffalo is so, what have we got here we've got packed fragments coming out where are they coming from uh, maybe the Top import here is packed, so let's put an unpack down. And I think, I can't remember exactly, I think the constraint, yeah, so this one was also at 10 times scale. So maybe what I'll do here is turn off these transforms for now. I'm going to say out. RBD collisions for vellum. And let's try and merge those in here. So, oops, here's our colliders that we had. So our buffalo and our frame. Let's object merge. Let's 
probably going to make it a little bit slow, but yeah, it'd be good to sort of see what it does. RBD collisions for Vellum. Probably, yeah, I'll just, I don't know, let's just merge it in and see what happens. Vellum solver. So you can see them in there as a guide. No, it's not too slow. Vellum's pretty quick, which is good, you know. It may, uh, it may change when, um, when the Vellum gets active, you know, we're doing that that sort of position-based activation using the bull, the buffalo to transfer um, that mass to where it goes red. That's when the mass is kind of activating. You can see it's starting to slow down a little bit. But let's see what happens when this when this barrel comes through. Hopefully, I guess it could be problematic because our transfer is actually happening a bit late now. So we may need to adjust that. So you can see the barrel came through before it was really activated. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. It's really, uh, it's really tearing, tearing it apart. I guess the other thing that we don't have in there is the frame as a collision for the barrels. Um, hey, Brendan, you're in your last week of VFX Foundations. Oh, cool. Um, how big of a learning curve jump is it from intro to Houdini Diploma? Um, look, it's I don't think it's a massive jump. I think by the end of the intro, you do have a pretty good handle on, you know, a lot of things in simple terms. We just ramp up the complexity. You know, it's not just going to be diving in, you know, to the deep end straight away. In the advanced diploma, you do kind of, yeah, it just, you know, it just increases over time. Uh, just like the intro did, you know, where it starts off slow and teaches you some basic things and then just gets more and more complex as you go. Um, I guess it's also down to you. How, you know, how, how did you find the intro? Um, especially towards the end, like, you know, if you were still struggling with some of those concepts, then you know, some of the parts in the advanced diploma might be tricky, but I mean that, you know, that's the good thing about working with a mentor who's experienced is that they will guide you through that and try and help you solve those problems. Um, or if there are things that don't make sense, they'll explain them to you in a way that, you know, hopefully helps you understand that stuff better. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of think you're in a, you're in a good spot towards the end of the intro. I mean, that's the way that it's been designed, that you go through the intro and you get all of those foundational kind of skills and introduction to a lot of things. And then we just build on that stuff. So I think it's a good transition. I, I wouldn't say it's a massive jump. Um, <laughs> how did that go down, Rusuan? Um, so yeah, you know, I, I think... If you're feeling comfortable by the end of the intro, then then it shouldn't be shouldn't be a problem at all. Yeah, no worries. I'd love to see what you've um, what you've come up with in your intro. You'll have to uh, you'll have to post post some stuff when you're finished, Brendan. Um, and you know, for for people doing this stuff in CG Spectrum as well, it, it's like you know we're we're teaching you. The tools and the knowledge to do these things and you can you can do you know anything with that you can just start a project like this and, and start to put in all those ideas that you've been taught um, it's you know I know I make it sound easy and I make it look easy but that's the idea is that you know you, you get taught these individual components you've been taught RPDs you haven't been taught vellum in the intro course um, but you know, you start to put all these things together and and you can, you know, produce a really kind of cool looking effect. Um, if you like Michael Bay movies and are good at math, it is just for you. That's right. Um, look, yeah, I mean, math is certainly a part of Houdini. Um, it doesn't... It, I, I feel like with Houdini, it's kind of... You can make it as technical as you like. Um, but I feel like there are definitely ways. If, if you know, technical and math 
kind of stuff for physics is not not your forte then then you can certainly do things in Houdini you, you will just be exposed you know to some to some things that maybe you don't you don't love but uh, uh no Rizwan I said uh, I don't have the internet open while I'm doing my stream so I'll, um, I'll check it out I'll check it out later um so well, there's a problem here with this barrel coming through it's coming through too early so what I could do in the SOP solver is do, 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 what do I want to do? What do I want to do? I've got my I've got my barrel stuff here, and oh, actually, I've got my um, I've got my buffalo in here. I don't I don't want that because then he'll be in there twice. Get rid of you. Okay, let's go back here. So here's our vellum solver. I'm going to try something here where I, let's see, I'm going to assemble, I'm going to pack this stuff because it makes it a little bit easier to do this. And I'm going to put down a uh, point wrangle, oops, or attribute wrangle, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm going to say if the length, oops, if length v at v is less than pick a number one how will i know when you've seen it uh well you will see me subscribe or you i can tell you next time um or i might comment on something if i feel so inclined um if length v at v less than one remove point uh and that's going to be zero for the first input at pt none for running it over all points that exist and then close that off error uh let's see why is it erroring because we don't have a v attribute let's transfer it v there we go attribute wrangle is erroring because oh i'm missing a bracket there we go look at that all right so what you can see is that Things are being removed when their velocity... Well, it's interesting. It's kind of uh, not really what I was expecting. Um, let's see. Length v at v less than 1. Remove point. Maybe the velocity actually might benefit from being recalculated. Sometimes velocity coming out of rigid body sims is a bit wacky. Um, okay, so... Why is this complaining? Length, it's just uh, length v at v at v. Just make sure I've got that. Yes, less than one. Oh, so maybe maybe my threshold is you know too low. Implicit cast from float to int. Why is it? Why is it saying that? I don't know. weird um so what it's doing it's jumping around a lot but what it should be doing is removing things that are below a certain threshold of speed they turned off your comments why did they turn off your comments um oh, let me turn off the assemble maybe maybe that is part of the problem the reason i put the assemble on there is because you can see it here it removes like partial geometry and i don't really want to do that so if i turn the assemble on it keeps the whole geometry. It could be a good way to just delete the whole thing rather than a primitive part of thing. Um, but... Oh, you know what? What do I want to do? I want to change it, I think. Less than... No. I would expect to see these fast-moving things. But I ain't. Which is weird. So, hmm, da, da, da. yeah, see how this is complaining? I don't know what's... Uh, can you shorten your timeline to where you're working, say, frame 13, when you start from the beginning, frame 13, it resets the scene. 
Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, you have down the bottom here these little arrows where you can truncate your timeline. So you could you could do something like that. Although that actually won't change your start frame. I think here... Oh, yeah, is that going to... There we go. So that, that one has changed my start frame. I don't ever really change my... Um, timeline that uh, I just don't change my start frame depending on what simulation time I'm working on usually I want it to be starting at one uh, but yeah I will always just change my start frame on my um, solver but yeah I, I mean I see what you're saying it, it does make it easier and it is annoying sometimes when you have a sim starting at a particular frame and you reset to frame one and then you have to come back to the frame that it starts on um, but yeah, look, you could do that if you if you find that helps, then um, you could certainly you could certainly do that. You can do that through here as well. Start start and end through the animation options. So I don't know what the hell's going on here. Assemble. Maybe the assemble is the problem. Create. Oh, maybe I'll turn on create name. I don't know if that. Yeah, I don't know. This, this is complaining about cl casting from float to int, and I don't really know why, because I'm doing a length, which it should be producing a float. Uh, but this v at v, you know, this is a vector, and I'm comparing it to a float, and then it's complaining about being an integer, which I just don't understand. Let's check out the geometry. So... V at V is a, you know, that's a vector. I mean, we could try this instead as well. We could create, let's say, at speed equals length V at V. So there's our speed. There we go. We can see some things are at 39, and that should be the things that are really motoring. Um, let's now try that in our if statement. So if at speed... We'll define speed as being a float there, just in case. If at speed is less than one, remove point zero at pt none. Well, it's not complaining. It's a good start. And there we go. So I don't. Yeah, I don't know why that wasn't working. It's really quite odd. But now what we can see is that until things activate, they're not present. Or until things go start going beyond a certain speed, they're, they're deleted. So they're just not there. And what it means is that these barrels, spe specifically the barrels, because they're the thing that's causing the problem, they're not there until they really start moving. So you can see then, as soon as they start moving, they start to appear. The reason I've done that is I'm thinking that I can bring that. Let's, so let's do this out. Um, moving barrels. I can bring that into this SOP solver that I've got here. This little thing in here. .NET SOP solver. There it is. So this one was where I was transferring from the Buffalo. I was transferring this mass 0 0.1 onto my tent. So I could merge moving barrels, there it is. So I could actually merge that into the mix and use that to and that is there's nothing present there. Oh, there we go. Uh, and they're packed, so we, we want to make sure that we... Oops. We want to make sure that we unpack that as well. So just unpack those after that. Okay. Let's see what happens with that. You know, it may, may cause problems, but hopefully, hopefully it's okay. Let's see. I did notice some of the crates there. Um, yeah, you see that? The crate... The, these little guys moving appear and then start activating these bits which you know is a little bit early 
So perhaps, I mean, we could remove the crates altogether from this, but we could also, um, Brendan, you were talking about a switch earlier. We could do something like this where, you know, we could um, put that in there and just say like $F greater than 39. We know that that's the, and swap that so that it's null first and then it'll switch at 39 to some barrels being on. We should see that switch to that side now. Um, looks like it's cooking the RBD sim again. There we go. So that should switch at that moment to that stuff. And there, there our barrels appear. So maybe that's a good way so that we don't have that happening at the start and we just switch it on at a particular time. So that can be a good use of the switch. You could do that in a wrangle as well, but you know, whatever. So now we've got our transfer from our buffalo again, which may be too big, but yeah, whatever. And we get to 39 or 40, and we should see that barrel start to come on and then start to transfer early. Here we go. Way before the buffalo gets there. And here's our barrel collision now. Nice. Uh, does it matter which side the null is on the switch to determine the evaluation of one or zero? Well, I guess it it depends, yeah, which side you want to be on or off, but left is zero, right is one. That's that's the, the way that that works. So, yeah, you just need to determine which one you want to be on, and then when it evaluates to true, $F is greater than 39 when it's 40, that will evaluate to the right side. So yeah, it flicks like that. Uh, switches can have more than one input, more than two inputs as well. So it starts at the left and then each subsequent input, it goes from left to right. Um, so there we go, just sheer chaos. And stretching. Probably could do with some more um, hey, no worries. Yeah, in general, nodes in Houdini are ordered left to right when you plug things in. Um, but you will notice, actually, when you have a look at a switch or a merge, when you plug things into them, you get this little list below. And if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to reorder things, sometimes it can be a little hard. When you look at the switch, you can actually hit the arrow to reorder the inputs. So, you know, this is from left to right. You can see transform four there is at the top. That's the leftmost one. You can reorder these so that, you know, if you wanted it to be a nice order like this one, I want to be the second input. So that's the vellum solver, I'll move that up. And there we go, we've got uh, almost, let's swap those around. There we go, nice and even. So you can play around with that as well, but it's always left to right. You can see there's zero is evaluating to that one. One now will be evaluating to that. Two, three. Yeah. So, okay. So yeah, there's a lot of kind of chaos going on here. It's pretty cool, but perhaps more cuts in our geometry might be good. This kind of is a bit weird too. And what that alerts me to is the fact that I don't have my frame, because you can see these bits of the barrel going through the frame and tearing up the roof. We don't want that. So we need to add our frame into our RBD simulation. Now, one thing I've been thinking of is that it would be really cool if the frame collapsed and the tent went with it. Which, um, let's try. We got, you know, 50 minutes. I'm sure I can get something happening. Let's, let's see what we can do. So we've got our object mergers and our our setup all kind of worked out, so we should have in here a frame. There it is. Let's let's do the oops. Let's do the old transform up to ten. Got some other bits and pieces in here as well. We've got these pegs which are holding the ropes. So we might just get rid of those. And 
got something there, which we don't need. Got these bits as well, which I'll probably get rid of. We'll just focus on the frame itself. Now, let's run it through the old RBD solver just to test. Uh, RBD, oh, what's it called? RBD bullet solver, there we go. Let's just do a little test and see what we get. Ground plane. Oh, beautiful. That's quite satisfying. <laughs> um, so yeah, cool. That's good. Now we could fracture them, but in reality, you know, with this type of effect, they, they probably aren't being fractured. Um, let's constrain them together though. So, again, assemble. Create a name. Let's call these frame. Let's then do a connect adjacent pieces. What are we creating here? Well, what we're sort of creating here is essentially the nails between these posts. So, we could up the search radius a little bit to create more of those. You can see, you know, that's kind of really created a lot of constraints there. So perhaps just play with that until, you know, point one seemed to give maybe too few. But if you just up it a little bit, that might be okay. Let's turn rest length on again. And I'm going to use that same RBD constraint properties node there. As I said, I don't think that input is really important when you're bringing it in separately, but we'll just do that. It's a soft constraint. Let's do position and rotation so it's more constrained. And up the stiffness. And then... Now, where are we going to do this? We could, we could just do it in a simplified solver. Because possibly there's not as much that we need to do with this one. So let's just try that. Uh, what have we got here? Collision geometry. So, this is the tricky thing because the first thing that gets hit is the cloth on here. But I want the cloth to be a simulation that uses the frame as a collider. I don't want the cloth to drive the frame. So I'm going to have to, I think, just fake the frame sort of being pulled down at a certain point. If we come back and have a look at our constraint, um, or our constraint and see in our vellum solver, reset, let's have a look at that. So, you know, our frame sim is going to replace that frame collider. Where is our cloth? There. What have I done? Oh. Okay. Okay. So let's try and work it out. So our buffalo hits here. RBD, uh, vellum and RBDs. No, I don't think you can. I think, yeah, I think, I'm pretty sure, mm, I could be wrong here. I know Vellum and Flip don't work together. Um, Vellum and RBDs, I can't remember. Um, Rizwan, I believe Brennan was talking about the Switch when I was talking about that. That's what he meant. Um, yeah, I can't remember. I, I feel like Adam... They don't, but I could be wrong about that. I have to test it. I, I feel like they don't. You know, the reason why I don't want to do that is this the same reason that I wouldn't do a bullet trying to collide with glass. It just becomes really kind of difficult to control, and I could spend days trying to set that up and never get it to work properly and not get a good RBD sim and a good vellum sim. Whereas if I fake it... Um, I have 
I have the control then to really design that effect and, and customize it to exactly what I want. That's the issue with mutual effectors is that even though it's cool, it's a really cool system. Yeah, I exactly. It, you know, it is heavy and it's cumbersome and it's hard to control. It's a really cool system and it's exciting to do that in simulation world. But in the reality of trying to get what you need out of it, not so much, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, that's why I would go for the, you know, just trying to work out how it's going to work together and then, you know, just make it happen. So we can see we've got this pulling sort of effect happening. And I'm thinking that, you know, it's that action of the buffalo pulling on the cloth that's going to start moving this and pulling it down. So perhaps what we could do is around, let's see, around 25, we'll start kind of putting some sort of force on this stuff, pushing it maybe. It could even just be a noise and a wind. Um, so yeah, you know. Uh, let's have a look at that and see what we could do. So we've got, we've got our buffalo in there as a collider. It's not going to do anything, I don't think. Um, what can we do? What can we do? Let's put a, we've got our pop wrangle here, which could be interesting to try, but let's just put a pop force on here and ignoring the, um, oops, ignoring the buffalo. Let's just try blowing. So here's our X axis and negative X is this way. So let's try blowing a negative force in that direction. And we've got a soft constraint here. Soft constraint. Yes. Don't have glue. Let's see what happens. Nothing. Great. Uh, all right, let's up that to a hundred. <laughs> awesome. Um, so that's that's wonderful. So that that's working, but we need to constrain to the ground. Or I mean, we could just try try doing something like this, where we increase friction to be so strong that it makes that stuff maybe hold onto the ground a little more, but it doesn't look like it. Um, deforming static ground, oh, ground plane has its own friction. Let's try that. Yeah, you see how that has really slowed it down? And perhaps if we, although that could, it could cause problems doing that. Um, <laughs> that's right. Gets the big hook, pulls it off. Um, yeah, okay, so maybe I won't, maybe I won't do it like that. Let's create a, instead of a ground plane, let's create a box or a grid. Mm, box is better because it actually has depth to it. Look, there are lots of ways of doing this. You can kind of create um, a constraint to nothing as well, but um, I like having something, something solid to constrain to. I think it's better. Um, so let's try that and I'm actually going to give it some divisions. So 10, 10. What I'm looking for here is points that are nearby because I'm going to give this a name and then I'm going to merge that here with my assembled frame. And I'm going to create connect adjacent pieces. Pieces from surface points. Let's see what that gives me. Uh, no, I guess I want pieces from points. Ooh, there we go. See how there's two little connections there? Now, there are sort of nicer ways of doing this, but I'm just going to do this in a kind of uh, pretty quick brute force, what I would describe as brute force technique, which is to just select the ones that are connecting to the ground. I hit delete and isolate those. 
so now I've got a constraint which is on the ground and I could use this RBD constraint properties again to just create glue network and oh, we could have the strength really hard or instead actually no I don't want to create a glue I do want to create a soft constraint because I want it to be able to bend I want it to be able to tip over whereas a glue will keep it very rigid so let's do that um, ba -ba -ba. oh maybe let's see yeah I think I can do this merge those two together gets yeah it gets a little bit kind of tricky working with the simplified RBD bullet software when you start getting slightly more complex but now I want to merge also this box in there as oh actually the box is going to be a collision object so collision that let's just call that one box ground box that'll be all right let's see if this works if not we may have to go the more custom route i can see some some um, constraints there so that's good and we've got soft and soft Okay, let's see if it works. Use collisions. It's a static collision this time. It's not deforming, so we don't need to worry about that. <laughs> well, look at that. Look, there, there is a constraint there, but it's just stretching to infinity. Let's go make it really stiff. Uh, rest length is on. Plug that in, see if that makes any difference. Womp, womp, womp. Weird. Uh, let's just do position. No dice. All right, let's try this one's position only and see if we can get that to kind of collapse. <laughs> oh, that's great. He's going for a walk. We've created a strand beast. Come on, somebody somebody must know what that is. Um, man, those things were so cool. That's great. Look at him go. I, so these constraints don't really seem to be working, which is... <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know why that isn't working. I want to build one strand beast yeah i've got a i bought a kit like a little toy one from japan well, i built one it was cool it's got a little fan on it you put it in the wind and it, it walks look them up if you don't know what a strand beast is i can't remember the guy's name but man those things were so cool um we had one that came to melbourne once and yeah it's epic um the the issue could be that we have two constraints named the same thing here so we could try just doing a hard constraint. That will change the name. And we do have the same degrees of freedom that we can choose. And that could potentially... <laughs> uh, maybe not. Oh man, that's so good. Well, my work here is done. Um, I don't know why that's not working. Let's choose glue. It, the, the thing... Yeah, this is just... This just doesn't seem to be working at all. Um, I guess, let's look at our constraints. We've got our glue here, set initial strength. Okay, so, you know, now that it's getting more complex, let's, let's just do it properly and move it over here. I'll duplicate this because we've already got one set up, so no need to, uh, completely rebuild but let's bring our box we'll put a second assemble down create pack geometry this one can be um i'll do this you know the way that i know works so s at con oh, you know what no need to do that again either let's just copy that Glue, null. 
well, look, that that is why it is not falling apart, definitely. And I haven't put in any breaking either. So that's that's why it is all staying constrained together. But what what should be working is the ground glue um, or the ground constraint, which is not working. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, but yeah, you're right. That That is why it is just staying together and walking along is because it is just... Um, has a lot of constraints and they're not breaking so they are just being allowed to kind of hold it all together so this one i'll call soft and we'll just define so this one could be our, our um, frame con and then we've got our null ground so you can see i mean this stuff does get pretty complicated so it's why I have a lot of nulls and I, I try to keep it. I mean, it does get kind of messy and I do need to clean it up, but I try and keep it nice and neat and um, and, and with lots of nulls, naming things so that I have lots of reference points where I can reference things. So I'm going to do create pack geometry out frame uh, RBD or out frame pack maybe just to distinguish it differently from any other time I might be calling the frame. Um, I'm not renaming it, so I've got frame, I've got box, connect adjacent pieces, yeah, all right, all right, let's, let's try again, so, I'll set that to start frame to one, create seclusion, don't need that, RBD barrels can become frame packed, RBD hoops can become uh, out ground there we go get rid of that one we'll change this one to be whoops a static static object is fine there we go concave that can be convex it doesn't need to be concave this one let's just check this show card geometry looks okay constraint network let's call this out frame con that's our soft constraint so that still works and then this one can be out ground glue there we go it's called glue okay we've got our gravity uh we've got our buffalo which we don't need don't need ground plane because we've got it as a box all right let's see what happens oh something's falling away there i don't know what that is random piece of geometry probably want to get rid of that um and let's Let's put in a pop force for post solve, pre solve, post solve. I don't think it matters. Let's do minus 100. <laughs> wow, that um, that glue just I don't think is is working. It just doesn't seem to be working. So let's check out why maybe. What have we got going on here? Frame box not renaming it whoosh that's right um so let's let's check out these guys here i'm going to select these constraints look at my geometry spreadsheet check out my primitives and oops points actually name so only show selected so you can see here so each with primitives for these constraints each um, each primitive has a name on each end, so it's got two points. One point will have one thing that it's constrained to, and the other point will have the name of the other thing that it's constrained to. So you can see here, we've got box zero and frame twenty-eight. So that's what you know. That's what should be should be happening. Let me just check this. I haven't renamed the frame. Ground glue. Constraint name. Constraint type. Let's just check that. Constraint type all. Constraint name glue. This one soft. Why you're not working glue soft? Let me turn off the soft constraint. So there's our there's our glue constraint. That that's what should be kind of. I you know what? I wonder. Oh look. That's the behaviour that I want, but I don't want the um, Oh, you know what? Let's just set this to negative one. 
Hey, there we go. So it was working. It was just breaking immediately. So setting glue to negative one means that it won't break ever. There's nothing, no amount of force will break that negative one. So what was happening was I've got a really strong force from this pop, um, pop force and it's just breaking that immediately. Now let's try making that a soft constraint. So bullet soft constraint relationship. Um, what? Akash says, can you please teach me Corona Render and V-Ray for 3ds Max? No, I cannot. Um, I, sorry, I'm just turning my heater off. It's getting quite warm in here now. It started at 12 degrees and now we're up to 20 degrees. Um, I don't use 3D Studio Max anymore. I did for a long time. I used it for about 10 years. Um, or maybe longer, I don't know. Um, and I changed to Houdini. Uh, I don't know how long ago now. Seven, eight, nine years ago, maybe. Um, and I don't use it anymore, I'm sorry. I don't have it. You know, I haven't used it for years. For a long time when I was learning Houdini, I kept around 3D Studio Max just as a kind of fail-safe backup. But, um, man, I'm so happy to have left that behind. If you think, uh, you know, well, you know, Houdini does crash from time to time, but I, I used to have a whiteboard in, uh, in one of the studios that I worked and we would, we would like put a, you know, put a dash down every time, uh, every time 3ds Max crashed because it, it happened so frequently. And, uh, I think I got up to like a hundred in one day. It's ridiculous. It is, uh, yeah. Now I'm, I'm really happy that I left that behind. So, uh, sorry, I cannot. Only Houdini now. The way of the future. Um, so you will see, I've just, I've just changed this from a glue constraint to a bullet soft constraint. And I just changed the data name to glue. It doesn't really matter. I mean, that's just the name and it just has to match. So I just, called it glue here but really I could call it anything you know it is just going to work as long as I make that match so if I put pizza in there it's gonna it's gonna give me pizza um so you know so that stiffness really high oh, interesting so really like oh there we go so I mean obviously that pop force is really strong and so it's a bit silly but there we go we got some things kind of moving a little bit but not you know not blowing over which is good okay so let's turn this back on and see if we can oh, it's a weird weird behavior let's turn this down stiffness so we can get it to be really floppy and maybe also if i change this to be like negative 100 as well i want to see this thing kind of pancake on the floor which it it just isn't so let's let's try um brendan what you were suggesting and reduce the amount of connections which you know could could very well be the problem uh is this software better than max and Maya? well look i'm incredibly biased in answering that but yes <laughs> uh for certainly for effects and for you know procedurally based systems and modeling it absolutely is I, uh, you know, I can't imagine doing any of the stuff that I do in either of those softwares now. They just feel really clunky and antiquated. So, yeah, you know, I, I think it is. Um, there we go. So, yeah, Brendan, you, you were right. Too many, too many nails. You can see, like, if we take it down too far, we get, we get nothing happening. But, um, you know, we can... Just sort of dial it in till it, till it works. You can always manually delete things as well. There we go. That's kind of what I was hoping to see. I think I need to make my box a little bit bigger. Because I don't want things hanging off the, the face of the earth. Let's go 150. <laughs> well, that's up to your mentor. <laughs> but good work. Um... Yeah, Alan, that's right. It'll change your life. Change mine. I, I was like, I was pretty sick of doing 3D, to be honest, in 3D Studio Max. Like, it was just brick wall after brick wall of things that, you know, you couldn't 
change. Um, and, you know, once I got over the initial shock of learning Houdini, um, it was like, oh man, I can do anything. And like a brick wall is just, I just need to kind of, you know, put, <laughs> put down enough nodes and I'll, you know, I'll be able to climb over it. Um, that, that's the thing about Houdini. It's like so flexible that you can, you can kind of just do anything and every problem is solvable. But I find in those other softwares, which have been around for a long time, there are just loads and loads of issues with them that you, you can't, you know, you can't get around. And a lot of the tools are kind of wrapped up, um, wrapped up tools that you can't get inside. So you can't get into the core of what makes them work. And that's the really cool thing about Houdini as well, is that if you want to, you can get into that, you know, that complexity. Um, all right. So this behavior is cool, obviously, you know, it's crazy, but we're getting some things happening now, which is, you know, it's what I wanted. It's getting pulled down, which is cool. Now we need to control that. So I'm just going to disconnect this pop force. How are we going for time? Yeah, I've still got a bit of time. Sub solver. And I think what I'll do here is deactivate the frame. So I'm going to set an attribute wrangle. If I need to do modeling, do you prefer to do it in Houdini? Uh, well, I do because, yeah, it is the only software that I, I use. Um, and I just kind of, you know, I deal with the kind of things that I don't love about modeling in Houdini. I just kind of, for a long time, like I said, I kept Max around. It was purely, a lot of that was for modeling. Um, I'm just getting rid of that little thing, whatever it is there. Um, a lot of that was for, for modeling and, um, and then, you know, I just, the more you practice in Houdini, the, the more you get used to the way that it kind of, um, it kind of works and you just get used to it. But look, I'm not modeling characters or anything like that. So, uh, I'm usually modeling just very simple things. So it really doesn't, um, so it really doesn't matter, you know, for me. But yeah, look, you know, I think if you're into modeling and then you want to bring that in to do simulations with it in Houdini or, or whatever, um, or add procedural stuff to it, then that's fine. And that's still how a lot of studios work is they will, their modeling department might be using Maya um, or 3ds Max and then they will maybe bring it into Houdini to do some really complex stuff that Maya just isn't good at. Um, Maya is too expensive. Yeah, well, they're all pretty expensive. I mean, Houdini at the studio level is super expensive as well, but yeah, at least we can use it cheaply as students or even as a semi-professional or a professional not making like tons of money, you can still get it pretty cheaply. Um, is this animation or simulation I'm doing? I'm doing mainly simulation, Akash, but it's being driven by some animation of Buffalo which I have not done. I brought that in. This is from True Bones. Um, it's a pack that you can get, which is free. True Bones Zoo, if you're interested. It's a whole bunch of animals. So that's driving my simulation. But yeah, a lot of what I'm doing is setting up now for a simulation to occur. So, all right. What was I doing? Oh, I've deactivated these pieces. So now, active equals zero on these pieces will now just not Nothing will happen to this. But it gives me the opportunity to now object merge in my buffalo maybe to drive the active attribute. I don't know. Let's bring him in. I can set here uh, active, whoops, attribute wrangle at active equals one. And then attribute transfer that value so it's i make sure it's an integer doesn't work if you accidentally make it a float there's that active attribute and we can transfer that based on you know a distance the same as what we were doing for the vellum so 
let's see what happens. Oh, and we do have to be careful. I can see I can see our um our box moving down there. We do have to be careful that we don't do that to our box. So let's just make sure that we call this I'm gonna call this ground because we don't want to merge that one out. RBD frame. Make sure we name all this stuff properly. Uh, you can reference from Securo Shadows Die Twice Bull Boss Fight if you need reference right in there. Oh, thanks. I'll look that up. I'm not familiar with that one, but it sounds cool. Um, so this one, ground, is static. And I definitely don't want this one to ever activate. So I'm going to... What am I going to do? I'm going to give this... This has a name called box. I might give it a name called ground. And this one has a name called frame, I think. We should be able to use that in here to choose a group. So we're not getting anything showing up, but if I say at, uh, let's see, destination group at name equals star frame star hopefully that will just apply it to the to the frame geometry let's see i don't want to see my box falling down though that's you know now nothing's really happening in this scene so let's just put a pop force in there as well so hopefully we can see something happen nothing um Let's see, we're transferring active. Sometimes it can be really hard to tell what's going on here. So what I might do is unpack and then transfer active and then just put a color. And do ramp from attribute active. Turn off that visualizer. And then in here, I can kind of scrub this. Oh, well, we can see nothing's happening. So maybe I made my distance threshold too low. Ah, uh, there we go. Look at that. Template the buffalo as well. Then we can kind of see stuff happening. So got a much larger, um, <laughs> there we go. Look at that. It's lighting up those, um, those top ones only, which is weird. You know, sometimes with pack geometry, it can be a little tricky to transfer things so sometimes you need to go quite a bit bigger with your distance threshold and there you can see now stuff is happening so let's make sure we put our view flag back here we don't want to send unpacked stuff to the sim because that that will just who knows what that will do um oh yeah there we go look at that let's try with that off and see if anything happens there we go. So we've got some things falling down. We've got, you know, maybe even the soft constraint holding that stuff together is kind of not necessary. Like, let's turn that off. It will hold together until the point that it, um, that it then activates and then it'll start to kind of fall down, which is kind of cool. Let's set our gravity because this is 10 times scale. Don't forget. So let's set our gravity to twice or oh, 10 times. What's weird is I'm still seeing these nails. I feel like, um, uh, you know what? I think this probably, and this is the problem with doing manual blasts is that I changed something up here, which potentially changed how my ground glue selection is going on. So you can see my ground glue now is no longer actually on the ground. So you have to be careful when you, um, when you do a manual thing like that, if you change something, you have to go back and, and fix it. So you can see that that search radius kind of got messed up. And okay, so let's try that again, blast. This blast actually could be done via a group and a bounding box, and that would be a better way to go about doing that selection. So, you know, a group in there based on you have to do it on points, bounding reach. Oh no, bounding box. I can make this primitives. Bounding box and then 
you know, set yourself a nice large bounding box, but keep it on the ground. And then blast that away. And then if I change stuff, it will always just keep that. So that little piece there, I don't know what that is, but some little thing over there. I don't know, probably it's okay to have it in the constraints. Let's see. Okay, so now we're getting things. All right, so let's turn this back on and see. Maybe we can up this a little bit. Setup of RBD sims is certainly time consuming, but it is kind of, you know, it's kind of worth it because you, you get some really cool simulations out of it um, in the end. It just, yeah, it just takes, you know, it takes time. So what could we do? In our pop force, I mean, we could turn that on, just leave it on and see. Interesting. Interesting what happens. It's pretty subtle. And that's kind of cool. I mean, it's not total destruction, but it is interesting, you know. That will do some interesting things to our vellum simulation, I'm sure. Like even just that sort of thing, sort of semi-collapsing there. This is not a house of cards or, you know, matchstick construction. So we do want things to be kind of a little bit constrained. We can go and adjust some of these things like the stiffness. We can take that right down so that maybe things are a little bit more floppy. Whoa. There we go. I mean, that's kind of cool. It's a little bit too bouncy, but it's kind of cool. Let's just see with regards to our buffalo. <laughs> nice. It's a little bit early there, that one. So one thing we could do, again, we could change the .NET um, start time, perhaps, to be, you know, what if we change it to 21 or something, 20. There we go. So yeah, it's a little bit springy, but he's really, he's really pulling that one along with him. Well, that's kind of cool. All right, let's just go with that. I mean, it needs, it does need refinement, but in the interest of getting something turned around in the next 10 minutes, let's drag up that .NET. Star RVD, star should give us just the frame, fetch geometry. Hey, there we go. Unpack. Retrail to calculate velocity again, just in case we're getting any wacky velocities coming from the RBD sim, and you know it's good to good to check as well. So we've got a marker here for V, and let's see. There's our velocity. So if you have a look at the unpack, oh, we need to transfer velocity from the unpack anyway. But you can see how they're really large on the unpack, and then when we retrail, well, even the vector changes. So the velocities that come out of the RBD sim are useful for the RBD to solve, but sometimes they're a little bit kind of either too large or too wacky, and you can get some really weird results when you then go on to use that for a collider or even for a motion blur. So it's a good idea to re, uh, redo them. Um, so out, frame for vellum. Go back here, you need to replace the frame here. Oops. Oops. So this one now is going to be from the RBD constraint and sim. Out frame for vellum. 
Uh, we need to put a time shift on here as well to clamp that. Copy our start frame, copy parameter. Clamp to first, paste rule to reference. There we go. Back. So that should match. Yep. Oh, we're missing those little pieces, but that should be alright. Don't need the transform now. Uh, hmm. Do, do, do. So, this is our collider coming through. Just check everything. Buffalo. Yeah. Okay. So, there's probably going to be some collisions happening here with, um, with the frame not being part of the crates and not being part of the barrels. Let's see what sort of madness we get from this. I think our frame is, yeah, our frame is deforming. And look, it's cloth is going with it, which is great. Because our cloth, don't forget, is constrained to our frame. So it will follow along with it and collapse. So we can see here, this is a problem. Again, we'll need to do that same kind of idea where with our barrels, we transferred mass so that anything that is moving does actually uh, affect the, the cloth. So we'll need to make sure that we do that for the frame as well. But now you can start to see we're getting some really cool kind of behavior happening. And it looks like because of my choice of how to set this up, it looks like the frame is being pulled along with the vellum, but it's not, you know, the frame is being done first. Um, and then, you know, the vellum is, is really following along with it. So we've got some extreme stretching here. So we need to play with our breaking. Some crazy stuff happening here as well. Probably substeps might, um, more substeps might help with our vellum. So yeah, a lot of work, you know, to, to go into fixing some of these things. But I think what's happening over here is really quite cool. You know, this now, this, this big beam coming down and pulling that vellum with it. A lot of stretching needs to be fixed, but, you know, I mean, we can't really see that from the camera angle that we've chosen that's like this. So yeah, the last thing that we probably need to do is just go... We've got our moving barrel kind of set up here. We could take our, let's take our setup here, or we could merge our frame in with that as well, potentially, but let's, let's just take that, put it on to the frame setup. So we're assembling, removing, calculating speed and then removing until the motion appears. There you go. And let's call that out moving frame. Go into our vellum solver. And you know, this is a simplified vellum solver. If you don't remember from last week, I cracked this open so I could access the .NET so that I could add this top solver in. And then I could do this again. So out moving frame. unpack it and let's just scrub and have a look it doesn't start until so yeah I had to do the switch with the barrels just because um, that had the crates in there as well but with this one I don't really need to do that it will just start transferring from around 20 and then that's the crucial one that was a bit of a problem so that one will be good we could do and a different attribute transfer, which is transferring, you know, a different amount of distance. So we just need to duplicate this kind of setup 
And in fact, we could choose a different color as well. We're not, we're just using color for the purposes of visualization. So you, know, you can make that pink and you can scrub it in here. So there we go, you can see that there. So it's quite, quite broad if you use that one at 15. So we could do something like that where it just activates it around that area. Play with it. All right, let's try that. So that's set to mass CD. Oops, jump out. So we'll see that red, and then we should start to see that pink happening as well. There we go. So the pink is just from the frame. Crucially, it's only, you know, when the frame is sort of moving that we're starting to see that. One thing you could do to that to make it activate maybe before the frame starts moving is to time shift the frame inside that swap solver forwards by one or two frames so that the cloth activates before the frame starts moving. And that might result in a slightly better motion as well. Um, now, that's a bit of an issue there, you know. So maybe we do need to increase the um, the activation sort of distance. Or you could try and create some recursive thing where it, once it's activated, it starts to activate the nearby areas as well so that you don't get this kind of thing happening where there's like inactive cloth in just a small area. Or maybe activate the whole thing by a certain time as well. But maybe I'll, maybe I'll just do this. See what that kind of ends up looking like. It's great to have control so that you can dial this in. And you could promote those parameters to the outside if you wanted to have a control out here. You could promote them to this, link them up to the Vellum Solver interface if you wanted, or you can have a null, which is like a control null that you, you know, that you use to to set various parameters on the inside. That can be useful sometimes. There we go, it's a little better. We're still getting like these tiny little corners of inactivity, um, which create this little dip here, which no, it's not perfect, but it's, it is better. It's only, yeah, it's a, only a problem now, sort of as this thing starts to fall. But we may get some tearing happening as well, which could be interesting. But there we go, our circus tent is collapsing on the clowns inside. Look at that, that's great. So that would be my approach, you know, for doing that sort of thing, rather than, um, Adam, as you, you were saying, the, um, the mutual way. This is kind of just a more controllable way where the vellum really just is following along for the ride. And it's a little bit easier to kind of work with. And then it's just about getting my vellum parameters right. I think some more tearing is probably good. You know, this is a really large piece that's getting pulled along by a barrel. Um, uh, no, I think I'll, I think I'll keep going with this for another week because I'd like to I'd like to sort of see what else you know what else I can get with you know from this um, let's see constrain and sim what have I got here RBD collisions for vellum uh, maybe I won't scale the vellum down and then I can then I can have a look at it all um, yeah no I think I'll keep going with it and and finish off a few things maybe look at some secondary types of effects as well which um you know it could be dust could be particles could uh potentially set some things on fire that'd be nice just have everything catch on fire um oh and you know there's really in terms of the asset there's plenty more look at that it's great um so much going on in here now 
Um, there's plenty more within this asset that we can look at in terms of adding to the destruction. Although, you know, it is all, it's all the same kind of stuff. It will just be me repeating these kind of ideas. Um, certainly I want to, I want to work on cleaning up the vellum. You know, you can see that there's some extreme stretching going on here. So possibly just running that with more substeps will fix that. Look at that. I mean, you know, it's looking really cool. And then rendering as well. I think, you know, we do have shaders set up for this stuff. So it would be cool to, um, to render this out, to see, see what it looks like rendered out. See some, some intersections going on. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a lot of fun, you know, to do this just to start with an asset and see what you can kind of um, see what you can kind of get out of it. Where's my buffalo? He's uh, it's a tiny tiny buffalo. And then you know, at the end of the day, we could set this up in such a way that we could add in multiple buffalo, have this as a stampede, and then just rerun the whole thing at once as a kind of dependency graph. Um, and that would be a really cool thing to look at as well, how to do that in Houdini. Um, probably wouldn't do it through PDG because I don't have great experience with that, but I'll do it in a, you know the method that I know. Um, but I know you could do that sort of thing with the PDG graphs as well. Um, but yeah, you know, that, that'd be a really cool thing to do is just basically create this as a automatic setup that you can go, Hey, I've changed the collision input. I want to rerun the whole sim and see what it looks like with an elephant running through or see what it looks like with 20 buffalo running through. Um, arguably we've done a bit of custom stuff, which may break when we do that. Um, but at least being able to change the input character would be an interesting thing just to see what happens when you, you, know, you change that to a bigger thing or a faster thing. 40 tenths, 300 elephants. Yeah, that would be, that would be very cool. It would be very cool for sure. Um, so yeah, I think I'll keep going with it next week and see, you know, see what we can, see what else we can kind of get going with it. Um, Cause there's, there's tons more tons more detail in this asset that we can certainly, you know, we can certainly play with. Get these wind chimes dangling. All these buckets. What about this poor bread here? Send that flying. I think it would be cool as well to, um, to fill the boxes with stuff and fill the crates with things. Whether it's liquid, that would be cool. Or, you know, just rigid body something maybe some live chickens mm. do all sorts of things but yeah it would be cool to you know really amp up that that sort of effect of stuff kind of you know bursting out of the crates when they get shattered i think a live chicken flying out would be amazing i don't know if i'd be able to do that um but yeah you know the barrels shattering and liquids spraying out that would be incredible to get in there you're looking at much higher <laughs> chicken crates, yeah. Um, you're looking at much higher simulation times when you get into fluid. So that's why I'm thinking RBDs would be, you know, much easier. Um, but, you know, one idea could be it was like a gunpowder barrel and it just explodes and, you know, sends the buffalo flying into, flying into space into a little starburst Pokemon style. Um, but yeah, you know, there's endless opportunities with something like this to go go completely crazy with simulations um in any case i could talk about chicken crates all day but uh, i have to go um thanks for joining me everybody i've been daniel hurrigan for uh, cg spectrum please um check out the website if you're interested in, in what courses we have to offer hit like and subscribe if you haven't already and i really appreciate you guys joining me every week to uh watch me do this crazy stuff and um, yeah, if you ever, ever have any questions or you don't want to see something, please put in the comments or, or ask me next time in the, in the chat. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next week. Have a good week, everybody. Thanks for joining me.